I saw them over in that area over there and uh, I've been swimming in Walden Pond for over 15 years and have never seen anything like it so it was a completely uh, new thing to see thousands and not just a couple jellyfish but thousands and thousands of jellyfish. But one of my students one day brought into me this jar of critters that she wondered what they were and they were freshwater jellyfish. That's what sparked my interest and we started digging into the literature. We found uh, just a few sightings in Pennsylvania over the years uh, but the first thing we did was put out a brochure by the thousands to every state park in Pennsylvania. The literature now says that they can be found on every continent in the world except Antarctica. Of the 67 counties, I can take you to places in well over 50 counties where there are jellyfish in this, in, in this state. And we have almost every state of the United States covered. Biologically, they're in the same phylum as, they're in the same major group as saltwater jellyfish. But then as you break down the classification of them, they come into a grouping of their own uh, based on their structure their life cycle. It's not the same as marine jellyfish in the most cases. Um, what you see and what you call a jellyfish is actually the medusa form, the adult form. They exist year-round as a microscopic polyp. Even if it becomes too harsh, the polyp will j condense down to a little flat disk and wait for favorable conditions to return. So then we maintained cultures of the polyps for 25 years. In this country, the common one everywhere is Craspedacusta. Craspedacusta uh, is easily identified just from, from its morphology, just the different structures that you can see. Uh, they're all about the same size, between a nickel and quarter size maximum as a medusa. Uh, they have fairly short tentacles, usually four longer ones and the rest are shorter. They typically have four radial canals on the top, uh, four gonads on the top. That jellyfish is either male or female <clears throat> and the gametes are released into the water. When the gametes come together to form a fertilized egg, that develops into a, a swimming larva. That swimming larva eventually settles down onto some surface. That swimming larva will form a polyp eventually. That polyp can produce buds on it that stay attached, so now we have two polyps. And another one, or three polyps, four polyps. And so you have a colony of polyps. Also, you can have budding off from a polyp, a third kind of bud, which will be a new little medusa. And those usually come off the top. They come off, if this is a developing medusa and this is a polyp, it's usually attached on the backside like that. And uh, it'll be a half a millimeter or so across, and it usually will have eight tentacle buds on it by the time it's released. So you have medusa, you have male and female medusa, you have a planula, you have a polyp. The polyp can produce a second kind of larva called a frustule larva. It can produce a polyp bud, it can produce a medusa bud, and then the medusa goes on to grow and the cycle continues. If there were a lot of polyps in the dish, we could be getting a hundred or more medusa out of that dish per week. The polyp itself is, is the, I think, the critical thing there that helps them survive because it can with, withstand adverse conditions. If, a, if it gets too cold, for example, the polyp can reduce right down to a flat disc called a podocyst, which has got just a little bit of cellular material in it. And I know in the laboratory we have taken our culture dishes and poured the water off and s stuck them in the freezer the polyps have shrunk right down to a podocyst. They just look like a dry, yellowish, tannish spot. And when they're totally hard like that and firm on the bottom of the dish, we've taken them out of the freezer, put water back in the dish, and within a month, they're a full-size polyp again, producing buds. So if that can happen in the lab, 
I'm sure it can happen in nature. It's not going to get nearly as cold down at the bottom of many of those bodies of water where they're found as it did in our freezer. So, To me, a bloom is a huge number of jellyfish appearing at about the same time. I have had uh, folks from around the country send me photos, videos, uh, movies of swimming or seeing blooms of jellyfish so thick it looked like snowfall in the water. It's, it has been suggested by some in the literature that there are there is an aerosol distribution. I think there's more we don't know than what we do know. Why is a population predominantly male or female on a given site rather than a lot of mix? Typically a population is male or female. There are very few places though, the Tennessee River is one, <clears throat> couple locations there, the very few places where it's reported they're consistently finding males and females together. So we don't understand that. What does that Medusa do in the wild to safely reach maturity? Because we never in 20 plus years could get Medusa to grow in the laboratory to the sexually mature stage of the Medusa. Why are they so unpredictable and sporadic? If I have a farm pond and I know I've got jellyfish in that farm pond because I've seen them, how come all of a sudden I may go for years and not see them? I mean, it's my farm pond, it's small, I can walk around it, I can look in it. It's not like we're talking about a lake where somebody just doesn't happen to go buy them in a boat. Uh, I really wish we could get figure out that mystery. Um, and this whole idea of, okay, what sex are they, where, and why? And for how long and when? And how, when is that determined in their life cycle? Is it determined in the polyp? Is it determined in the developing medusa? Is it determined when the medusa gets closer to sexual maturity by the temperature of the water? Uh, I, I, to me, that, that boggles my mind. They move by contracting their body and making a smaller opening on the bottom, so it's kind of like jet propulsion. You know, it's a hydrostatic kind of thing. Well, they have uh, like a nerve net. Uh, I mean, they know when they come in contact with something on the tentacles, because the tentacles will try to grab it, or wrap it, and bring it up to the mouth, which is underneath. Uh, and that, the little stinging cells, the nematocysts, the little, the little wart-looking knob where that's located has got a trigger on it that's sensitive to touch so that's what makes those fire off um, they have balancing organs they have what are called statocysts around the bell uh, which is those are common in cnidarians uh, and that helps them maintain their balance uh, I don't know if they know when they're right side up or upside down, but I'm thinking they do because they quite often, at least in tanks, they'll go to the bottom and turn over and the tentacles will be up in the water like they're, you know, trolling, <laughs> trying to catch something going by. Dr. Peart, you're a pioneer in exploring unusual creatures in unexpected habitats. Now, one of the things that we want to do with our show is look at some other unexpected habitats. We're looking at the atmosphere. That Earth's atmosphere is a potential habitat. As we started looking, researching this, we found that there were thousands of reports of people seeing weird things in the atmosphere, at all different levels of the atmosphere, pilots and astronauts. And as we looked at uh, these objects, we noticed that there, was a, a lot of sim there were a lot of similarities to gelatinous invertebrates. I'd be curious if, if, if you know, you'd maybe take a moment to, to look at this. Would you, would you want to take a look? Sure. At okay, great. Sure. I always believe that anything's worth looking at. Okay. There's always questions. To me, anything is fair game. I don't have a closed mind when it comes to science. Great. So has anybody hypothesized what they think that is?
って。うん I thought at first, but then when I see them go off in an opposite direction, what the heck are these things? They're bizarre. Looks like a jellyfish. Stuff is bizarre. This one up here appeared to have a little bit of a tail on it. Hmm. This stuff's pretty amazing. This view uh, showing uh, look at all the stuff. The satellite again, uh, just moving into sunrise. Eighty one nautical miles now from Columbia. Guys getting the image? Franklin, uh, we see a long line, a couple of star like things and a lot of things swimming in the foreground. Can you describe what you're seeing? Well the long line is uh, is a tether, um, and uh, there's a little bit of debris that uh, kind of flies with us, and uh, it's uh, illuminated by the sun at such low angles. So this is just a lot of stray light, and it's getting washed out uh, quickly, but uh, Claude is trying to do a, a quick, uh, good job here adjusting the cameras. Copy that. You know, that description by the crew, this is in the satellite, but the satellite with 12. Oh, look at that. Approximately 12 miles of tether still attached to it. Columbia and the satellite are now just passing over the west coast of uh, northern Africa. The two spacecraft are now 90 nautical miles apart. Controllers for the satellite uh, did have communications uh, with it uh, during the close pass uh, between Columbia and the satellite. Tommy Houston, that's a much better view, uh, a lot more contrast visible. And how wide uh, does that tether appear to be? We, we see, it seems to resemble a, a much wider strand than we'd expect. Can you describe which way the, uh, the satellite is visible on that uh, strand? Looks like a busy place out there, doesn't it? Amazing. Amazing this stuff.
That looks like a lion's mane jellyfish. <laughs> wow. Interesting stuff. What, what do we have that we've used to study other things that we can study those? What makes them change direction? That's what gets me. I can kind of accept them flying by if they're all like following a pattern, you know. But when they're getting closer and farther away and changing direction, I, I well, what is that all about? <laughs> you <know? laughs> How are you going to corner it? How are you going to get it to sit still long enough? Or, right. Or how are you going to match its speed so that you can do that? Uh, man, I don't know. Are, are we ahead of our time? I mean, do, are we ahead of the technology to really do it? I would like to know, is anybody using any of the current technology we have to look at this stuff like they look at other things? You start by looking at the evidence. There's no literature to go to. You don't do your normal literature search to do this research, so you start collecting everything you can find about it, and and uh, then you get people together and you brainstorm. And you, you know, when you when you're brainstorming, any idea is fair game. You really got to think outside the box. Looks like a jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing.